This might be a, a, a good point in time, uh, Alan, for you to sort of give us a, an example of how you would analyze a particular situation. It can either be persuasive, asymmetrical, as Professor Gruna calls it, or cooperative. And, and to, to, give, to give the viewers more of a sense of, of how the system would be applied in a sort of a descriptive, in a descriptive manner. You know, it was interesting, you, you were raised in Iowa, did you say? Right. You know, when I, uh, I was raised all over the place, but, <laughs> um, but my, you know, my professional life really began in Silicon Valley, and, and I entered there in the early 80s literally at the time when the late Steve Jobs was poking his finger in the chest of no less than IBM. And, you know, it was hard not to be influenced uh, by, by that. And it was hard uh, over the years, and as you watch Jobs and a variety of other of his contemporaries that, you know, that, that inhabit high tech, um, that you had to have some respect for, for how they did what they did, how they defined their companies and their brands, um, and and clearly it was part of their recipe for success and so I think that that played a very strong role as I sought to understand what I perceived to be games and gamesmanship uh, of these people in that environment um, it did not occur to me and I think many of my contemporaries that this was about cultivation um, or co-orientation, co that those are, those are very mature concepts for a very immature industry. So I am humbled by your, uh, you know, by, by your suggestions um, for how much more or, or how much farther my system needs to go, but I'm still nonetheless tantalized by the idea that we can and should have a, a, a stable proven system that tells us the row and the seat number of the things we're doing, whether or not it be access or whether or not it be a stratagem I call, I don't know, a bait, for instance, like that. Um, I'm interested to know if there is another dimension and there is some way that we could merge them together or maybe they just simply collaborate side by side. But to use an example, since I mentioned Steve Jobs, uh, you know, Apple has recently been in the news um, with its rather ill-advised announcement of their own attempt at, uh, at mapping. They introduced into their, their uh, iOS 6 operating system something called Apple Maps, and they kicked out Google, Google Maps to do it. Apple Maps was not very good. It was terrible, in fact. Ultimately, over a period of days, Apple was made a series of moves to try to quell the angry masses of their fantastic, you know, customer base, and there's a couple of a couple things that they did, which which uh, are easily identified within my system. The first is that they employed a, a play or an influence strategy called the deflect, um, where a spokesperson level person said, "We really hope that people understand, uh, and that, that they'll be patient with us, and this is something that we'll work on and that we'll get better." It was sort of a a play called a deflect and maybe to some extent a play called a recast. They're just simply trying to change the information so it suits their perspective and maybe buys them some, them some time. Well, of course, that didn't work. And so days later then, the pressure became too much. And, uh, and um, Tim Cook, the new CEO um, of Apple, was ultimately forced to flat out apologize and to acknowledge the flaw. And in the system, we have a play that is named after a strategy of parliamentary debate. And it may seem like a, a strange name, but we like to honor parliamentary debate. And the, the name of the play is a disco. Insofar as Tim Cook took one step back to acknowledge a, a flaw, and then theoretically having gained some modicum of forgiveness, he could then move forward again. It's probably the play that he should have run first. Or they should have moder moderated or uh, modified somehow the way that they positioned Apple Maps uh, through a different set of influence strategies. But those are a couple simple examples of, mm -hmm. of how I can look at the system at a campaign, at uh, an advertisement, 
uh, at a talking points memo at a presidential debate, mm -hmm. uh, and I can use it like a chemist does or like a biologist will use a phylo phylogenetic tree, that's, that's the goal, to understand down to an elemental or sort of atomic level, if you will, what exactly is happening. Dr. Grunig mentioned a couple minutes ago McDonald's working with and collaborating with environmental groups. Can you describe a situation, uh, a case similar to that, that, that and, and use your system to sort of describe a collaborative, a collaboration, if you will, between two organizations? I suppose part of what you just described with regard to Apple was, was Apple, if you will, sort of collaborating with its, cust its loyal customer base, but yeah. not quite the same thing. I'm just curious if there's another example you can give us that would, would demonstrate collaboration and how yeah. you would describe it through yeah. the system. Well, we've done a lot of work in, uh, in two sectors uh, uh, that are more and more requiring collaboration in pharmaceutical uh, business and in the energy business mm -hmm. with two notable companies. And what's interesting is that both of these uh, client companies over time have realized that, that we, can, we can map this on the system. We can realize that they, they have not been able to, to employ the same kinds of plays that Steve Jobs would toward IBM. That only increases hostility, let's say, between uh, a pharmaceutical company and, let's say, HIV activists or, or, or mommy bloggers or, you know, those people who are very, very active. Um, usually against the interests of pharmaceuticals. So what, uh, what both uh, pharma companies and energy companies have found out is that they, in fact, have to engage much more in, in two-way and symmetric uh, dialogue, genuinely uh, understanding, genuinely empathetic uh, exchanges to wrestle their positions uh, t together. So, you know, and this is sort of what interests me about how, how or if we can, we can merge uh, excellence theory with, if, if I may say, uh, you know, influence strategy, this model that I have, so that we can have a full model. Because clearly, different companies under different circumstances, to my way of thinking, run different plays. I'd like to get back to this question that you used the terms, Professor Green, normative and positive. And I guess I'd, I'd, I'd turn to you. Alan and ask, you know, you've, you've said to me a number of times that, that you are trying to describe what is, not what should be, with, with your system. Um, having said that, is there, can there, w would you see a normative role uh, for, your, for your system in, in, the, in, the, in the way that Professor Grudy described, described his, his theories as, as being regarded as more normative than positive in, in, in some instances? Well, that, they're both normative they're both, I understand, and positive. I understand, yes. Because a good normative theory is one that you can provide evidence that it actually works, works. in practice. Right, so what I'm looking for is the question of what would you recommend to mm -hmm. a client right. when something occurs? What is going right. to be most effective, right. however you define that, and I'm not sure how you define that. Right, okay. Well, uh, there, there are two questions on the table that speak to um, two sides of me, I suppose. One is as the, 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 uh, the principal investigator, you know, of the system, and the other is as an interpreter of it, as a consultant. And I am in business and I do sell products and services based on the system, so I, I clearly do have a, a view, um, and it varies by, by, you know, by case, but I probably generally do have a view for how to apply it. Um, each of the influence strategies that we've described um, is rated. Uh, we, we, have, we have taken to, um, through, I, through a process that I can't recall right now, but, but, um, but we've tried to responsibly rate both the transparency levels, mm -hmm. the relative transparency levels of each play, and the risks and rewards of each. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the risks and rewards are what's what can be pretty interesting here and what is potentially an intersection for us because I think if you look at a play that we call the red herring, which is a distraction device, you throw a red herring, you know, away from the direction you're going so they'll go that way. Clearly there are, clearly that's a high risk uh, influence strategy to employ and clearly it's not symmetric. Um, 
and so you could you could look you could look at uh, you could do an analysis of each of the 24 and try to understand which are the high risk plays and start to understand okay that's more symmetrical that's more asymmetrical and so on and so forth now as it relates to how i uh, how i counsel um, i'll admit to you that i am probably more of a competitivist than i am a collaborativist uh, to use those and it's because of where i come from i come from silicon valley and and you know i i learn at the knee and i advise at the elbows of of uh, kind of cowboy marketers, if you will, who are trying to create market share, who are trying to drive innovations into markets, very young markets. And so I am more inclined uh, toward what I suppose may be um, asymmetric approaches or even one-way approaches, uh, because in that environment, I believe it tends to work. Um, but I'm probably not so skilled, you know, in more mature industries that have um, more complex um, uh, you know, variations of, of, of many, many different competing publics. What do you mean by work, quote unquote? Work? Work. That implies some kind of outcome. So what is the outcome that occurs that made you say it works? It would depend on the client um, the, uh, and, and the matter at hand. Um, but in, in the environments that I've advised in, uh, what you want is um, some, sen some measurable sense or knowable sense that an idea is dominating over others, that a criteria, uh, that your criteria for purchase uh, or for selection of something is dominating over others, that um, you are positioned optimally as better and that a competitor is positioned less so. There, I think, um, again, in the environment to which I am so well adjusted very often has to do with um, you know, competitive advantage and relative competitive advantage. My clients tend to want to know, am I in front of that guy? And that, is, that may offend your sensibilities uh, or go against the grain of the excellence theory, um, but that is that is honestly uh, the sort of situations that I tend to counsel in because a client will need to be quite literally ahead in whether it's financial or it's market share or it's mind share. They want to have a relative competitive advantage as gained through the strategies that we advise on. Well, I tend to think that one gets ahead or is able to compete most effectively when you have relationships with your publics whether they be your employees, your consumers, the community, the government, uh, investors, and so on. If you have a good relationship with them, you gain competitive advantage over your competitors because those relationships are very difficult to take away. Once you develop relationships, they're, they're very important. So there is an axiom in, in marketing, you know, it's easier to keep a customer than to gain a customer. So. I tend to think that I'm not sure I want to come back to how you measure whether those outcomes occur, whether sure. your idea is dominating, yeah. whether it is, is it through media exposure that you're measuring this, or is it through purchases, or is it surveys of attitudes, do they prefer your product over another one, or how do you actually measure those outcomes that you're interested in? Well, you, any and all of those ways. It, it, it always, it's always client dependent. It, 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 it but does the client know what to measure? Well, the client sometimes need to be edu needs to be educated to measure. Right. The clients are sometimes happy if viscerally they think something has happened. Uh, and you know, I, I have some background in that and I, and I usually do try to convince them that they need to have some assurances. They need to establish a baseline. They need to have a criteria that they're measuring against. They need to know who exactly they're measuring or under what circumstances. And then we need to have a steady protocol that we use, not just the first time, but the second and third and the fourth. So that can happen uh, through uh, you know, Boolean logic searches over, over media. It can happen through uh, focus groups. It can happen through private information or, or semi-public channels, like for instance, subscription newsletters are often an interesting source. Um, but nowadays, we're also measuring uh, the content of, of Twitters, mm -hmm. of tweets mm -hmm. and posts. Right. Because each of them, uh, if you understand the context, you can drive from them 
again, to use my terminology, the plays that are being run. Mm -hmm. I think that digital media also offer an enormous opportunity for learning and listening, Absolutely. which I think public relations people and probably marketing people yeah. uh, too often do not use. They tend to think of creating buzz or likes or, or discussion and so on without stepping back and just monitoring through search engines or, or whatever. It's something as simple as a Google search to see what, uh, what people are thinking about and how they're reacting and so on, instead of just assuming that the more attention mm -hmm. there is to my company, uh, the better it is for me. You know, one of the things that occurs to me is that, um, is that in the, the maintenance of relationships, the cultivation of relationships is undoubtedly important. But what I've seen in my career um, are, are situations where it appears to be useful to, in fact, find a foil to find uh, some thing or some person or some topic that you disagree with in order to offset and to punctuate what you are about as a, let's say a company. So if I'm coming out with a better microprocessor uh, based on some sort of uh, new technology, I can talk about that and I can cultivate relationships amongst people or organizations who think my technology is good. But in order to really create real interest in real discussion and higher relevance, it often pays off um, to find the inferior microprocessor architecture mm -hmm. so that you can compare the two. Now, that is marketing-wise useful, but I would have to say that as you, if you find that foil, sometimes we use the phrase repositioning or even depositioning, then you're, you're, you're almost you're cultivating, in fact, negative relationships. You're For the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're doing something that's, that's not only different, but in fact almost exactly against what excellence theory is all about. So I don't, and I can look at that and I can, I can know that that works, but, I, but that's why I have an orientation. I respect relationships, but frankly, I can sometimes advise a client to create, literally create, a negative relationship in order to create relevance and interest. That's obviously what's going on in the presidential election. It's yes, it is. It's only a week away <laughs> in which uh, Obama in particular is trying to, to paint Romney as such a negative alternative that no one would want to have a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's interesting because when it comes to something like an election, I haven't quite figured out how to run a symmetrical campaign <laughs> yet. Uh, let me, let me but it would be interesting to, uh, to try. I think it, a symmetrical campaign would be almost, if you will, to ignore the opposition and try to find out what the, your, the publics who are likely to vote for you know, it's entirely possible that yeah. you simply cannot cultivate the sure. relationship. Well, the, the research people. question is, does, uh, does asymmetry catch up with a player oh, at, always. at some point? Right, always. Right. <laughs> uh, because asymmetry is always, I think, equated with not telling the whole truth. It's mm -hmm. usually not, not lying, but you only emphasize those aspects of your product, say, that you think will appeal to your customers if we're talking about marketing, such as what used to be called a unique selling proposition. Right. But then you get the product and you find out all of the bad things that it does as well. And if you haven't owned up to them, uh, then the relationship is going to deteriorate. So that's where I think disclosure is a wonderful thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you go out and tell all the bad things about your product, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you try to find out what those are ahead of time and deal with them. Uh, so that you can eliminate as many of them as possible and then you disclose what you've done to fix the problems. 